Doing the Bible reading. So our Old Testament Bible reading today is Isaiah 42, 1 to 9. Here is my servant. I take good care of him. I have chosen him and I am very pleased with him. I will put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out. He will not raise his voice in the streets. He will not break a bent twig. He will not put out a dimly burning flame. He will be faithful and make everything right. He will not grow weak or lose hope and he will not give up until he brings justice to the earth. The islands will put their hope on his teachings. God created the heavens and earth and stretches them out. The Lord spreads out the earth with everything that grows on it. He gives breath to its people. He gives life to those who walk on it. He says to his servant, I, the Lord, have chosen you to do what is right. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you safe. You will put into effect my covenant with the people of Israel and you will be a light for the Gentiles. You will open eyes that can't see. You will set promised prisoners free. Those who sit in darkness will come out of their cells. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not let any other God share my glory. I will not let statues of God share my praise. What I said would happen has taken place. Now I announce new things to you. Before they even begin to happen, I announce them to you. A New Testament reading is Mark 1, 14 to 18. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee. He preached the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. One day Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. There he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. They were throwing a net into the lake. They were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left. They left their nets and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Alrighty then, where we're going to continue on in our series called The Road to Resurrection, in which we're going to be wending our way through the Gospels. Um, I'm going to be mainly concentrating on the Gospel of Mark as we do that, because Mark is a very succinct, very uh, pithy Gospel. It's the shortest, sharpest, most uh, impactful of the Gospels, I suppose you would say. It's like reading a fast-paced novel. And, and what we tried to say last week was that the Gospel writers didn't just report what they saw, but rather they, they had it had heavily edited. They couldn't, say, they couldn't write everything they saw, as John actually explained in his Gospel. If I write down everything that Jesus did and said, it, there was, there's not enough books in the world to contain it all. So what they had to do, and also this is actually was a serious problem back then, papyrus was in short supply. And scribes were expensive. So um, getting the message out there had to be really pithy. And so uh, the message that the gospel writers were trying to get out was that Jesus is the king. And that he is the one that was predicted in the old covenant, in the old testament, who would come and be the king of Israel. And from that beachhead he would go on to be king of the world. And that is the big message, the gospel message, which is meant to go out into the world and change the world. In fact, if we go back into the last hymn and go back, backwards, the next, the next one back, just there. This is Charles Wesley, and Charles got this. He says, and Charles often says things like this in his gospel um, hymns. This one he says, he, that is Jesus, sits at God's right hand, which means that, that he is ruling and reigning, He's God's right-hand man, and, and sitting, of course, is a sign of authority. And he's going to reign from God's right hand until all his foes submit and bow at his command and fall beneath his feet. 
And that's pretty much a shorthand of the whole of 1 Corinthians 15, which is a description of the gospel. And it goes through to say, and here's the gospel I received. I passed on to you that Jesus died, that he was raised on the third day, that he was witnessed by Peter and by 500 people all at once. And, and his triumph over death is going to be um, uh, brought out in all its fullness later on when he has brought all the kingdoms of this world under his control and the last great kingdom to fall will be the kingdom of death and when death has been overcome then Jesus is going to wrap it all up it's going to hand it back to God the Father and then God will be all in all and everything will be restored that's the big picture of the gospel that's the, the reign of God coming back into the earth and undoing this 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 unglorious just just hideous mess that we live in you know war and and conflict and family breakdown and and death and sickness and all that stuff is all going to be squashed underneath the feet of Jesus Christ and that is what the gospel preachers wrote in the gospels is what the gospel preachers preached in the book of acts 18 times in the book of Acts, they preached the gospel and every single time they said Jesus is Messiah. That's the gospel. The gospel is not that you can get your sins forgiven and go to heaven when you die. In fact, going to heaven when you die, as I've mentioned many times, is not mentioned once in the scriptures. But what is mentioned numerous times is that Jesus is the king who's going to push out all the other kings and all the other kingdoms and eventually it'll be the last kingdom standing and then God will be all in all. That is the big message. That's the message that Charles Wesley and the preachers from his time mainly preached that, by the way. But since Charles Wesley, which was 1700s till now, there's been a warping of the gospel. That's been forgotten and put aside and in its place in the evangelical churches of the world, has come a new gospel, which is not actually the gospel, even though it's true to some degree, that through the blood of Christ you've received forgiveness of sins, and that makes you right with God. That's true, but it's not the gospel. That sounds like a heresy, doesn't it? It sounds like a heresy just because you've so often heard that, and it's been passed off as the gospel, when in fact it is not the gospel. It's good, and it's news, and that news is good news, but it's not the gospel. Let me go on back to that picture we had before. I think I might have used this before. See that picture there? That's all meat. Every bit of that. If God didn't want us to eat animals, he wouldn't have made them out of meat. That's all meat, but it's not all rib. There's only one bit of it there that's rib, and that's that bit there at the top in the middle. The rest of it's all meat. But if rib happens to be the thing that you want, you can't just replace it with something else. It's all meat, but it's not all rib. And not all good news is the gospel. Like if I was to say all the things that are news in the scriptures that are good, or things that are good, you can have lots of things that would classify as news that is good, therefore good news. But not everything that is good, and not all news that is good, is the gospel. The word gospel means something very particular, just like rib means something very particular. It's not just meat, it's a very particular cut of meat. And the gospel is a very particular cut of news that is good. So it's good news, isn't it, that Jesus, through the blood of Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Is that good? It's great, wonderful news. Not the gospel, though. It's news that is good, but it's not the gospel. Don't see, I don't know if I can make that any plainer. But let's get rid of that picture now. <laughs> All right, so um, the big central idea of Christian faith is what the ch we in the church call the gospel. And all four of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, have all tried to put forward what I've just explained then, that the good news is that Jesus is the true king. And then the preachers who came in the early church went on to say, and the reason we can be sure that that is true, the validating fact behind it is that Jesus rose from the dead, proving the truth of his assertion that he is the Messiah and um, the one chosen by God to be king of the Jews and through the Jews to be king of the world. 
And look, if you're not sure about that, look, this is what John in his gospel writes near the end of the gospel of John in John 20 verses 30 to 31. Um, he says, but, well, I said before how he, he said, um, the Apostle John said, now Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's a pretty, that's a pretty succinct presentation of the gospel. So he's written these things. The gospel was written. What was the reason for writing it? So that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one chosen by God to rule the world. He is the Son of God. It means the same thing. Messiah, Son of Man, Christ, Son of God, all, or all just mean the same thing. And that by believing, by trusting in him, and entering into his kingdom, if I was to add that, you may have life in his name. That is the gospel. Very simple presentation of the gospel. Now, we could go on and talk about how, how, the, how these things are true through the death of Jesus on the cross, your sins are forgiven. That's not the gospel. That's, that's what you call a subheading under the gospel, an explanation of the gospel. But the proclamation of the gospel itself is that Jesus... He's the guy. He's the one. He's the hope of the world. And the proof of that, of course, is the resurrection. So the purpose of the gospel writers was to bring that truth forward and that we would see that and then believe it. Which brings us back to the gospel of Mark. Last week we saw how um, John the Baptist had begun the ministry. He was the segue between the old covenant and the new. He was the last great prophet of the old covenant he was the the greatest um, Jesus said he was the greatest of the prophets because he was the most privileged of the prophets prophets he wasn't better than Elijah he just happened to be more privileged than than Elijah because he got to be the one that had the privilege of announcing here's the Messiah right here here's the kingdom of God about to break into human history and uh, and then he went on to say even the least of the people who are who are in the kingdom that's you and me a greater than John the Baptist. Again, not better than John the Baptist, but more privileged than him. He got to announce it, but we get to live in it. A lot of excitement out there, I see. <laughs> so, I'm sure there's excitement behind those masks. I just can't see it. That, that's all. So, It's a good Anglo-Saxon thing, of course, to not give away your emotions. Goodness sakes, no. Anyway, um, so we go. I'm just going to concentrate on a very short passage here in, in Mark. And it talks about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So Jesus is now coming. He takes centre stage. John the Baptist moves off to the wings. And now Jesus comes in. He's the one announced. So it's almost like, you know, at the beginning of a show, you get uh, the, the person who comes in and says, and w welcome come, that you've all come here tonight. And I'd like to introduce you to the star of the show tonight. And in comes the star. Well, Jesus is the star of this show. He walks in. John the Baptist goes to one side. And something begins anew. And then Mark 1.14 says this. After John was put in prison. That's really going off into the wings, that is. <laughs> Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news very short little thing isn't it so here's the good news he went preaching good news the gospel of God the time has come the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe and some translations actually says gospel and I think that's the best way to put it it's not just news that is good it's not just any good news it's the good news the gospel that the kingdom of God has come so he begins by saying the time has come. I'm not going to concentrate on that. I think I've hit that pretty hard over the Advent season over the last couple of years. And if you haven't got that worked out yet, then you're never going to get it. But, uh, you, know, all the, you know, all the circumstances were lined up. The, the stars were literally in the right place in the, in the heavens. The 490-year post-exile, the time of the, 
it had to be during the time of the fourth great empire since the Babylonians, the Roman Empire. There was a virgin from the tribe of Judah in the line of King David became pregnant. He was announced by the prophet in the likeness of Elijah. And there's a thousand other things we could mention. All these things all line up in a way that could never be repeated, literally because the stars could never be in that position again. And all these things line up and Jesus steps in right at the epicenter of all of those converging lines. Boom. And steps out onto the stage of world history. And he comes saying, repent and believe the good news. And I just want to concentrate on those three words today. Repent, belief, and gospel. Good news. So the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Um, and these words, unfortunately, that is repent, believe, and gospel, have acquired over the years religious overtones um, over, the, uh, over the last two millennia. And, and so they've lost some of the original oomph. But what I have to say is that all three of those words, repent, and the word believe, and the word gospel, were not religious words. They didn't come out of the Jewish faith. They were common words in, secular, in the secular world. And if you heard them, if you lived 2,000 years ago and you heard someone say repent, you wouldn't be thinking in terms that we do. When you hear the word repent, you think of some guy with mad eyes and crazy hair, right? Or is it crazy hair and mad eyes? I'm not sure. You know, some prophet, some weirdo. going to say, repent! That kind of thing. But in ancient times, the word repent was nearly always used in a political setting, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so if a, a local king had moved in and taken over your territory, he would send out envoys into the area and say, your local lord who you used to serve, of." I've overpowered him, he's in prison, if he's lucky, probably dead. And now I've taken over your territory, so you need to repent, that is, change your mind, and no longer serve that old king and start serving me. That was the way that word was used. Um, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the reason these words have acquired a more religious and spiritual overtone over the years is because... Uh, we have changed the gospel to mean something like, here's the problem, you're a sinner, therefore you, you deserve God's judgment, but God sent Jesus to be a scapegoat for us, to take our judgment in his death on the cross, so that if you believe in Jesus, you can be forgiven and have eternal life. And when we say eternal life, we generally mean that to mean living with God in heaven forever. But that's not what the early church preached. And only some of those things are true. Most of, most of what I just said then is both unbiblical and simply not true. And I know, again, I know that if you've been brought up in an evangelical church like me, it's going to, it's going to sound wrong, what I just said. But I want to say the truth is better than that. The gospel, very clearly in the scriptures, in the gospels and in Acts, they never preach that. Not once, not ever. But what they did preach is Jesus is Messiah. He's the king. And the kingdom of God comes to him. Um, and unfortunately, because of this other version of the gospel, then those words, repent, believe, and gospel, have been watered down and they've lost their original meaning. So we're going to review those words within their context and see what they mean. And hopefully it'll bring forward the truth that the gospel is about Jesus being Messiah, who's bringing the reign of God to the earth, the kingdom of God. So repent. Repentance is often seen in terms of being sorry for past sins and deciding to change your evil ways to follow the example and the teaching of Jesus. Now, that's all good. I highly recommend all those things. If you've done some stupid, evil things in the past, you should be sorry about that. And you ought to say... I, you know, I regret that and change your mind and change your behaviour. That's all good. That's just not what the word repentance means in the early church. Um, 
Because what we mean by sin here is that we mean our moral failures, our peccadilloes, our indiscretions and good old fashioned evil behaviour. But that's not what John the Baptist meant when he said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's not saying repent and feel sorry for the bad things you've done and change your behaviour because now the kingdom of God's coming. That's not what he meant when he said it. And certainly not what the early church preachers meant when they said it either. And again, all of that stuff, that immorality stuff, that has to be dealt with along the way. But that's, again, it's a subheading under the big heading of who are you going to follow? Who's going to be your king? So, um, so when uh, in the first century context someone came preaching repentance, it was about changing your worldview and transferring your allegiance from whoever you were following over to Jesus. That's what repent actually means. And, and the sin that you're repenting of is the sin of following someone who's not the king. So, and again, because that's a, that's a, the word repent was a political, secular word that meant um, there's a new king in town, you need to change your allegiance. The early church adopted that and said, that's exactly what we want to communicate and say, no, the emperor of Rome is not the true king. The emperor of Rome, by the way, used to call himself the king of kings and the lord of lords. He even referred to himself as a son of God. And he insisted, more or less, different emperors insisted on this more or less, but say Domitian, for example, who was around at the time of the early church, he absolutely insisted that you worship him as the son of God and he set up effigies of himself in every town and village and it was required by the local governor to make sure that every citizen of Rome worshipped him as, as the king of kings and lord of lords and son of God. So you can imagine how that went down when the church was going around saying, actually, no, we disagree. We think Jesus is the king of kings and the lord of lords and he's the true son of God and he's the one who's going to lead us into the light and it's not going to be not going to be the emperor. You can't imagine that the emperor went, oh, well, that seems fair. No, what they, what they did when they found out that was happening is they went out and murdered a whole bunch of Christians. That's what happened. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Imagine if you were in um, Russia right now and you said, I don't think Putin is going to lead us into the light. I reckon some... No, that wouldn't last long, would it? So the gospel is not just spiritual. It is spiritual, I have to say that. But it's also political. And it's not just political. It's political and spiritual. And it's not just political and spiritual either. It's everything. It's social. It's spiritual. It's religious. It's philosophical. And, it's, and, and the gospel is the, is the grand good news that's bigger than any other good news that's out there, or so-called good news. Right, let me give you a perfect example of, of what I would call a gospel, biblical repentance. Jesus has been crucified, two guys either side of him. Jesus got a sign above his head that says, King of the Jews, put there by Pilate. And that was actually a stunning thing to say, because it was meant to be a mockery, but Jesus actually is the King of the Jews, and he's exercising his rulership while being crucified, which is a stunning thing. But there's two guys either side of him who I rep rep represent the entire human race. On one side, there's a guy saying, well, if you're such a hot rod, why don't you free yourself and free us while you're at it, if you really are the Messiah, and make fun of him. And thinks, well, if, you, if you're a Messiah, you're not a very good one. Getting murdered on a cross is not a great way to advance your career as a king of the world. And that is what represents about you know one big chunk of the human race saying Jesus is not Messiah. Here he is, look at him, thinks he's Messiah, King of the Jews. I don't think so, right? But there's another guy on the other side of him who says, shut up, we're getting what we deserve. This guy's done nothing wrong. And then he turns to him and he says in Luke 23, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. There's a lot going on in that, but just, I just want to concentrate on this thing. Remember me when you come. He repented. In other words, 
And I actually believe that he was a lieutenant of, of uh, Barabbas, and that Barabbas was his guy. He thought Barabbas was going to lead Israel into the light. He, I even believe he actually thought that Barabbas might be the Messiah. And then when he's on the cross, and I think there was a backstory to this that it all built up, and he suddenly realized, oh, you are the Messiah. Which would be a weird thing to say to someone getting murdered on a cross. Which meant that he's the first guy on earth to realize that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. That the death wasn't the end for this guy. He was going to be stronger than death. I think this guy had a bigger, deeper revelation than any of the apostles. And he says, and when he says, remember me, he's saying, I'm changing sides. I want to be thought of. I want you to acknowledge that I'm your follower now and I'm on your side. I am one of your guys now. I'm changing my allegiance, I'm dumping Barabbas and I'm putting, I'm putting myself under your service now. Receive me as one of your guys. That's what he's really saying. Does that make sense? And that is repentance. Not once did he say, oh gosh, I'm aware of all the stupid things I've done, all my peccadilloes, all my immorality. I'm sure that was there as well. I mean, there was there's partial acknowledgement of that, saying we get what we're getting, what we deserve. But he was getting what he deserved because he was opposing the Roman Empire, and I think he was aware of his own shortcomings in this whole thing. And suddenly he realised Jesus is the King, even while he's being crucified, and says, "I'm putting my allegiance with you." That is biblical repentance. All right. And then um, Jesus said, so repent and believe. And the word believe there can just as easily be translated as faith. It comes from the Greek word pistis, which, can, which means believe or, or, or have faith. Um, but even the words faith and believe must not be understood in kind of religious terms. That is, most times faith is understood as having a sort of knowing the things that are true about Jesus and then believing that those things are true. Having a correct set of doctrines and believing the 64 things you need to know about Jesus to be classed as an orthodox believer. And that's all helpful and everything, but that's not what the word believe means in this context. Um, and again, if a political leader went out saying, claiming a territory and their envoy said, repent, change your mind, the new king's in place, get on board with the new kingdom, then they would say, and you must now believe, put your faith in this new king, which means something like, um, a, it, it's, I mean, it's, de it's, a, it's demanding of a, an action of trust and alignment and to keep faith with the one in whom you now believe. You know, so here, let me give an example of that. For me, to be faithful to my wife doesn't just mean I believe 10 good things about my wife. And she's got more than 10 good things, I'm, I'm sure you'll find. But it's not just me believing in her existence or believing true things about her that makes me faithful to her. It means I forsake others. I forsake all others for her and I keep faith with my wife by demonstrating that with continuous loyalty to her and supporting the vows that I made to her on my wedding day. Does that, does that make sense? So keeping faith is not believing, just believing things about her, it is remaining loyal to her and forsaking others. And to be, in other words, to believe in Jesus as king means that you forsake all other kings and you say the other kings are not real kings. There are, king, there are kings and king, all kings and and there's authorities in this world that should be on it, but they're not the king of kings. The king of kings, the only place for the king of kings is the true king of kings, and we're saying Jesus is that guy, nobody else. So you have to you give faithful allegiance and loyalty and support to the true king. And again, here's a biblical example of that. In Acts chapter 19, uh, verses 17 to 19, after... Paul had been preaching the gospel in the area, it says that fear fell upon them all, that is the people who had been hearing about this and the wonders and signs they saw, and the name of Jesus was extolled. Also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver, which comes to a value of millions of dollars in today's 
in today's terms. So what they're saying is, we used to follow certain religious practices and give our allegiance to certain spiritual lords, and now we're saying, actually, we don't think they are lords after all, and we're not going to obey them anymore, and we demonstrate that by taking their very valuable religious books, our spells and incantations and things that we hold in the highest and greatest of value, and we take them to the, to the bonfire and we throw them on. Burn them up in front of everyone. That is the practice. That's, that's belief in a very practical way. It's giving loyalty not to their old lords anymore, but they're throwing their loyalty aside and uh, to that old god, to that old system, to that old notion, and they're giving it now to Jesus. And that brings us to the last word that Jesus said here, which is gospel. And again, the word gospel is not merely news that is good. It is generally an announcement of political significance related to the birth of or the victory of a certain king or the ascension of a king to power. So imagine there was a coup in Russia right now and, um, and Putin was assassinated or imprisoned. I dare say there'd be a few Ukrainians who would think that was good news. Um, but let's just say this all took, hand, took, took place at the hand of one of his generals. And the first thing that general would have to do would be to put out the gospel that Putin's reign was over and the new and better ruler was in charge. Now, if you know anything about Russian history, you'll know that's never been true in the past. And you shouldn't think it's going to be true in the future either. Russia almost seems to have a curse on it, which is we get a bad leader, we get rid of that bad leader, and we replace it with one who is worse. And they just keep doing that until they got to the bottom of the pit when they got Stalin. And then uh, they slightly improved after that, and now they've gone back down into the pit again. And that's, that's Russian history. But nonetheless, every time a new king comes, a new czar or king or despot comes into Russia, they assassinate the former leader and they send out the good news. Good news is that old dastardly king is dead and now I'm replacing him. I'm pretty sure most of the people didn't take that as very good news. They just thought, well, we'll see. And it always turned out to be pretty bad. But in this case, the good news about Jesus is He's saying, all the other kings, all the other kingdoms, they belong under the rule of the true king as the king of the kings and the lord of the lords. So we've got to put that aside and uh, now put Jesus in first place. There can only be one person in first place and Jesus is saying, and I'm that guy. Which is a pretty big claim to make, but of course the validity of that claim comes with the resurrection, which is why we're looking at this. This is the road to resurrection, because the resurrection is the big stamp of approval from God that says, boom, Jesus is the true king. I mean, Jesus is also, in this very passage we had read out to us, he's anointed by God, by the Holy Spirit after his baptism, and the voice from heaven came, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's all, you know, that's all validating as well. But the resurrection is the big thing. So, um, so now the gospel, when it goes out into the world now, it still has the same effect if it truly is the gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel of how you can go to heaven when you die, but the gospel of the King Jesus would mean that if you were in a Muslim country living in Iran, say, for example, and you got up on the street corner and says, Jesus is the Christ, the King, the Messiah, the ruler, guess what? Somebody's going to murder you. Because what you're really saying is, if Jesus is king, that means Muhammad isn't. And it means Allah is not God. Just some spiritual, malevolent spiritual being, not the true God. And if you got up in China, and this is actually happening right as we speak right now, if you're a Christian leader and you say that the CCP is not the supreme power in China, but Jesus is, you will go to prison and tens of thousands of Christian pastors and leaders are now, right now, in prison for a mandatory term of seven years just for saying that. That's mandatory. That's average. And if a person in the West hears the gospel that Jesus is the king, and as I said before, there's 24 million kingdoms in Australia, 
because each person is their own king of their own destiny and you have a skull-sized kingdom and governments in Australia, what we do is we say, you look after all that other stuff we don't want to care about, like the police force and the army and taxes and all that, but we'll vote for you if you're going to look after my kingdom. If you're going to make me richer and happier and let me do whatever I want, then I won't bother you and you won't bother me. That's how it works in the West. And make no mistake, this is real. And when the kingdom of God comes to an Aussie and says, Jesus is king, you're not the king of your own world, you hear the hue and cry that goes up and is going up right now, which is, I want to follow my heart. My destiny is mine. I'm just going to follow my dreams. Well, Jesus said, no, you're not the king of that anymore. I'm the king of your dreams and your destiny. And you've got to follow me. But this is the way I want to be. And you, you've got to accept me as I am. Where does it say that in the Bible? <laughs> That's a made up Western value. So the kingdom of God comes in and it opposes every form of government and philosophy and ideology and every religion doesn't, doesn't, doesn't always oppose it. I mean, you know, there, there is a relevant place for different things, but none of those places, in, none of those things are in first place. And some of those things should be kicked off the, off the ship altogether and thrown off, you know, thrown off. But everything has its place and it's under the kingdom of God and Jesus is meant to rule over all the kingdoms so when the gospel comes to you what are you meant to do with it? you're meant to repent that is change your allegiance I'm going to change my allegiance from myself and put it with Jesus as a westerner or if you're Islamic you change it from Muhammad and Allah and you give it to Jesus and God the Father if you're a communist you say that the supreme authority belongs with Jesus not the communist party And then I'm going to believe, which I'm going to give my loyal, faithful service to that king, which is Jesus. And I'm going to believe the gospel, the good news, that Jesus is the true king and that he is the one who's bringing the kingdom of actually God, not the kingdom of men or the kingdom of some hopeful philosophy. And the good news about the good news is that it's good news to every single person on earth in every situation that they could possibly be be and it's and it's relevant all of the time you know i used to try to sell people the gospel and say do you realize that you've offended god with your sins you've done some terrible things and some people wouldn't even feel bad about their sins that i haven't done anything wrong i'm a good bloke until you could solve them problem you couldn't sell them a solution but this this is this that's not the gospel the gospel is Jesus is king, and you're not, and neither is anyone else. So get on board, because this kingdom is displacing all the other kingdoms, and it's going to be, Jesus will rule whether you like it or not, whether you vote for him or not, it doesn't make any difference, he's the king. So get involved now while you can. And how do you do that? Jesus, remember me as one of your people. I want to follow you. I don't want to follow this other philosophy, religion, notion, political system. I want you to be a king because that's the great hope of the world. It's the hope of humanity. It's the only hope that is stronger than death because death makes a mockery of all other systems. But Jesus is king even over the power and strength of death. And that makes him king of kings, makes him lord of lords, and it means you should make him your king. Amen.